Oh, we're still live. (laughs) And unpublish. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. (laughs) Chad had to arrive at the moment. (laughs) I'm Ian with full throttle battery. (laughs) And he's uh, enjoying a lovely Zero Ultra Monster uh, energy drink there to the disdain of his wife True. um and so we're trying a few things out different today we got some new hardware in the studio and uh hopefully it'll um improve some of the workflow for me so i'm not spending four hours plus every hour of podcast um that we do editing all this down and uh, it also enables us to live stream so less we're... editing more talking hey that can't be a bad thing right i mean <laughs> So, yeah, we're doing a, a, a live stream here and trying it out, see what happens. And if it goes well, maybe we'll try to do this more often and, and bring some of the uh, community involved into it. Um, I think it'd be cool to have, you know, people chat with us while we're doing it, chat with our guests while they're being interviewed, um, maybe even drop a, a call in and, and do it over the uh, air as well. Um, I don't think we'll ever do video um, inclusion, but maybe we'll do audio call in type stuff. Uh, but definitely, you know, ask questions and, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm just kind of preparing for um, uh, for the big trip coming up to take over uh, Coos Bay. As you can see, I'm, I'm honking my hat today. So I've already gotten crap from Ian on it. And uh, it's going to be a good time, I think. I know it's going to be a good time. No question about it. It is uh, causing me to lose some hair. That's for sure. Uh, we're in the final stages of prep. I My rigs are ready to go. They're not wrapped. So Monday, I have a show on Saturday. Then I go from that show to putting a new set of doors on the X3. Then it has to go to get wrapped on Monday, including the four-seater. It's going to be a busy few days, no doubt about it. How are you holding up? Oh, Lord, I don't even know how I'm breathing at the moment. Um, <laughs> I mean, Ian sat here in this in the studio chair uh, watching me panic with hardware and wires for the last, I don't know, 45 minutes <laughs> to try to make this work and uh, trying to do the best I can. And then we had the garage. I had to get that cleaned up, get the cars uh, ready to come in and put some new doors on for you. And, and that's going to happen here pretty soon. Um but uh, yeah, I got so much. I mean, I'm running the social media for Takeover. That's a huge task. Um, trying to integrate some of the uh, some of the people that are coming to the to the event um, and communicating with that's always you know time consuming. Um, trying to manage uh, just logistics of camera equipment and figuring out what you need to take and not to take and and all that's going to be a big thing. But some big news: I'm not taking the razor uh, to Takeover. So that's going to be interesting. I uh, got a little something something coming uh, next week that I'm going to pick up. I'll uh, keep it a little secret for now, but um, 1,500 pounds of fury. <laughs> 50, I, I think it's a little more than 1,500 Pro- pounds. Probably like 1,600 pounds, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll be uh, sporting a different car out there, something that we may have gotten from a vendor or something. So something. it should be a good time. I think it'll be interesting to see how that car performs out there. It's it's not a big dune car, but it's a car that a lot of people buy. So it'll be interesting to see what happens out there. And it'll be my official little media rig. So if you happen to see me in a in a vehicle that you're not used to seeing me in, um, there's a reason for it. And we'll be filming and doing a bunch of stuff and look forward to that content coming soon. Yeah, it's going to be a really busy week. You know, I, I, we've got uh, two, we've got a photographer coming in. We've got a videographer coming in. I'm coming in. And uh, <laughs> what are you coming into? Are you coming into your manhood or what are we doing here? The event. <laughs> but uh, I'll let a little bit of the cat out of the bag. I got, oh, I got a buddy that is uh, bringing in a, um, he's bringing in a four seater that has a boom attached to it that is uh, got a basically c- cinematographer camera on the end of it. And, you know, seeing that thing go through all the whoops. You know, it's funny, when we started to talk about technical difficulties, we didn't take into consideration spilling Monster onto the new technological apparatus. And Zach... Spend money, throw it into the the water and see how it does. Yeah, and we've been live for seven minutes and 55 seconds, and that's all it took for Zach to spill a drink all over some... What looks to be very critical gear. (laughs) (laughs) Critical, but yet also very expensive. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I still see I still see lights on though. It appears to be functioning. 
Well, if it survives uh, <laughs> this episode, it might be a testament to the quality of the equipment. <laughs> you, you insured it, didn't you? I, it's funny you say that. I bought the accidental drop and damage insurance from Allstate. For does it, it com- d- does it cover monster juice? <laughs> I I don't know if they have a clause in there for your mango loco monster, but yeah. uh I think I know the problem is you're not rocking a side by side not rocking a side by side guy's cup holder. I so. think I just need to keep it away from the electronics. That's a good call. <laughs> and I have two of them open. What the heck? All right. Crazy episode. Um already. This is gonna get very interesting. Hopefully it's not inside the equipment. <laughs> All right, so takeover uh what's been going on in your neighborhood uh before takeover as we get into the role of getting ready to go out what else is going on i am preparing for that show as well as every other show like as it sits right now you know I, i've missed a few episodes some health issues with uh, my mom my dad so i'm kind of contending with that but like uh in relation to what i have on the schedule it's literally going from takeover having about three four days off going to another event not having any time off and then jumping to basically i'll I'll probably be home maybe about 10 to 15 days between now and uh, august 8th and then on uh, august 8th i get home i'll probably be home for about three weeks and then september is lining up to be without question probably the busiest three week stretch five week stretch of my entire career it's gonna be it's gonna be nuts and you know hopefully find some opportunity to get some riding in at a recreational level. You know, it, a lot of the riding that we're doing is going to be out content creating, uh, essentially checking new places out, checking new places off the list. Um, we get to go back to Sand Hollow here pretty soon. And oddly enough, even though that that's four or five months away, I'm still prepping for it now and trying to figure out uh, our big projects, which is our BDR runs, trying to get those dialed in for either – mid early september or early october somewhere in there just trying to figure out where we can squeeze them in because it's it's gotten ridiculous yeah you've uh also got a, a couple cars like you were saying that you're working on the pro went through a sort of, sort of transformation over the last few weeks what's been going on there so the pro has gotten a baja rack with a whole bunch of light on it from uh, baja designs I think you could probably see that car from space right now. I mean, there's so much light on it right now that we have overwhelmed the stator at an idle. Right. So we got to get it up to operational RPMs to get all the light to work at the same time. And I've run it at dark, and it's ridiculous. It's surreal, actually. Um, so, we, so just 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 count how many lights you have on that car, just from Baja Designs. Um, on that car, we've got two LP4s on the bumper, two LP4s on the roof rack, and three LP6s in conjunction with the LP4s on the roof rack. So to give you an actual wattage draw on that, I'm not 100% sure, but it's a lot of power, no doubt about it, a lot of light. So those LP4s, I think they put around, was it 14,000 lumen? or Somewhere in there, and they pull four amps. You know, so that's always something I'm kind of calculating in the back of my head. What what's the stator putting out versus you know my RPM versus how much am I consuming? You know, you throw a couple LP6s on the bumper, or if you run a couple LP6s, by and large you're pretty good. But we've driven some places, like especially on the Washington BDR, we drove some places that are pitch black, like pitch black. So having that extra light is going to be really handy. Yeah, the you're 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 encroaching on the six figures of lumens just on your light bars easily, <laughs> easily. <laughs> so yeah, the, and the 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 X3 really isn't too far behind. You know, the X3 is running the uh, Baja Designs headlight kit. It's running two uh, four LP4s on the bumper, two uh, two clear, two amber. So it's it's pushing a lot of lumens as well. And I, I've actually run that thing. I've got a little time on that one, and it works really really well. Yeah, I'm really. I think. You know, I've communicated when we put them, when we install them, those, the S1s are an amazing little light. Versatile too. And the headlight kit coming with three on each side. Uh, I think the headlight kit comes with one flood and two spots. Yeah. And I think they could have easily gone with two floods, one spot, just because of how stinking bright those cubes are. And I really want to get a couple of those uh, floods. Um, I want to get like four of them or maybe even six of them put on the Razor as front flood, side flood, rear flood camp lighting and and create a bunch of scene lighting yeah yeah camp lighting is really critical with those things i've seen those little s1s get used for everything from a cargo light in the back of a ram truck um to a headlight kit you know and when we put that when we put that headlight kit on it was kind of interesting because we did a uh essentially it doubled to maybe even a little bit more the light output of the stock assembly 
then we put that 10 inch bar, the racer plus on the shock tower. And then we put the, the LP- Onyx six plus correct. And that thing is R- Onyx six racer plus, right? Yeah. And, uh, that thing, that thing goes for sure. It really gets out there. And then we put the LP fours on the bumper and those were the ambers. And now the ambers are running in conjunction with a clear light with a clear LP four. So what's on my headlights is double stock. What's on my sh- shock tower actually eclipses the headlight assembly. The LP fours are just a totally different animal. The LP fours are, they're ridiculous. And the way that they're wired in right now is when you run my driving lights, only one of the, uh, or all two of the um, spot S ones go off. When I hit the brights and go all the way bright, the LP fours on the bumper, the clear ones will fire up and they are no joke, man. Yeah, I was really impressed with them. Uh, for one, build quality obviously is is through the roof. Um, the the U.S. made components are always high quality, uh, but the light output, how good it looks. You know, it's not like cheap blue Chinese LEDs. It's a, it's got that nice warm look to it, and it's not going to fatigue your eyes, uh, which I really appreciate. You're talking uh, the the LP fours. Yeah, the LP just the Baja light lights all them all together they all have the same color temperature yeah and so they all match yeah and the only time they would vary is if you put the amber lens on or or whatever but uh just the you know when like on the razor we have you know like a cheap uh chinese light bar on it that does really well it's a great light bar for how much you pay for it um but it's really blue it's not it's not super blue but it's just really daylight temperature um and when you're going fast at night through the trails it can fatigue your eyes quite a bit and the uh, baja designs equipment it it just makes it easier on your eyes your eyes don't feel like they're working as hard the longest drive i ever did at night with the current setup was on the ambers just running the ambers the entire time and in terms of eye fatigue there's zero of it you know it really cuts rain it cuts dirt it was very very comfortable for i mean that run we did from chelan to conkin only was about two and a half hours and they just they were great yeah i I appreciate them a lot and i can't wait to to try to acquire some of those S ones. I think those will be really good integration lights because they're so small um, and they can put them anywhere um, and they don't really put off. I mean, they get hot, but for what I'd be using them for, they wouldn't be on all the time. Right. And uh, they would be a great solution for that. And I think it'd be really cool to see if Baja came out with like a cabin light system or like a, a rock light system that was based off of that, that just wasn't like maybe half, half the output uh, just because that form factor is nice and compact and, and easy to use. Yeah, they're using their rock lights, if I remember correctly, are the same as their dome lights. And I think there's some limited colors. I think you can get to amber, blue, and white. They're bright, no question about it. I have yet to come across a reason to need them. You know, I think if I was running some rock lights, it'd be more for a camp thing, you know, just having a little bit of light while I set up my tent. But I may very well, just based on how bright the LP4s are, I might actually just take the S1, the S1 flood off of the headlight assembly and stick it on the side of my cage at like a 45 down angle somewhere in there. And then I'd have all the camp lighting I need because currently my buggy whip, my buggy whip is serving (laughs) as a camp light for everyone. (laughs) It's it's pretty bright. (laughs) Yeah. But the the thing that that I don't think you connect with is that your trailer, you have a light system built into it. You got, you know, some full river batteries and some LED stripping and all that uh, in your enclosed. Um, and you haven't really had to do a whole lot of trail repair on the side at night. Uh, the rock lights really shine in those areas of like open flat trailers right. when you're loading up at night. Uh, it makes things way easier being able to see everything around it. Um, or if you're doing like a belt repair or a tie rod repair or something like that where you, you need to see what you're doing in the middle of the dark. Um, like when we were on our uh, Idaho trip, I was in the clutch cover cleaning the clutch out every other day. And it was usually, you know, once everybody got camp set up. So it was yeah. like, you know, having that light there was a big benefit. And, For sure. and that's where rock lights really shine as far as an applicable, like an, a, a, a real, real, real world use uh, versus just trying to look cool. Right. Right. But uh, yeah, so um, I have uh, the razor uh, in the garage tore apart at the moment. It's It looks like a bone stock razor at the moment. But uh, that's How'd you be- pull, pull the rack off? So yeah, the brack is completely off. Everything is off the machine. And I had to, so we, in our Winchester trip, I nosedive that thing into, you know, a blowout on the dunes. Um, that bent some of the holding brackets that hold the top of the radiator uh, straight. It bent them, you know, in cockeyed 
areas. And so I had to bend those. I had to take the whole fascia off, take everything apart, uh, bend those back. And it's still not perfect, but it's pretty close. Um, the hood, the latches on the hood, um, the tabs broke off. So I had to buy a new hood. <clears throat> and when I went to put the new hood on, it was standing off the, the plastics by probably an inch. Yeah. So um, I had to bend all those back, got them all straight as best as I could. Radiator didn't seem to have any uh, leaks, but it did have some impacts from different components that got pushed into it. Um, so that was a bummer, but it's not leaking. So hopefully that continues to be solid. Um, but uh, I took the whole ra- the whole roof assembly off, the windshield assembly off, all the wiring is getting replaced. So right now in the garage, we have a number of products for review and um, look forward to some unboxing videos dropping here this week. I'm going to try to get, oh, cool. get those all out. Um, and so we're talking... I have uh, a quick, like, quick review of the Pro Eagle Jack, which is now on the bench, so you can take that home now. <laughs> um, uh, do a quick. I have a quick review of that. We have uh, the rear light bars, um, uh, chase bar going on uh, to replace the. Um, can't remember the brand at the moment, uh, chase bar that was on it. Um, and then we have the rear light bars pro eight, uh, switching system. So that's a, um, like a, a solid panel switcher, like you would, ex- like you would see on a switch pros or something. Um, but it has a master on off switch on the, on the controller. And then it has a full, um, eight channels of relay switching that have, actual replaceable parts so you have actual automotive relays you have actual automotive fuses um and it's not all one piece in solid state and it's not gonna if one thing fails the whole thing fails yeah it's you know fully serviceable and it's all one kit so it's gonna be super nice yeah um so look forward to that and then we have now correct me if i'm wrong on the um on your new rear tail light that was our neighbor's at takeover in Coos Bay in the fall, right? Yep, yep. Kind of, definitely an active participant in that in that show circuit. So, yep, that'll be cool to see. Yeah, so uh, I actually was talking to them last year, and I was like, you know, that's a really cool solution. Um, look forward to looking at it a little bit more. And uh, then uh, reached out, talked to them this year, and, and so they sent some over. And uh, so the unboxing videos will come out uh, this week and then and maybe into next week uh, before takeover. And then I'll do the full install and review when I get back from Oregon. Uh, and then hopefully in time uh, to get it out on do some filming with it. So I think we're going to wind up in a position where we got to do some long-term reviews because – like looking at your sh- at your workbench down in the garage, like you said, there's eight billion things that you were going to film and cover. Um, the pro just got new STM clutches. The uh, I got a Garmin tread that showed up. You know, these are all things that we should talk about. And I think by the end of October, I'll have enough time on that Garmin tread. That will have put us on the Onyx platform, the Gaia platform, the Magellan platform, and the Onyx, or I'm sorry, the, um, um, did I say Garmin? Yeah. Yeah, so so four different platforms. And I think that's probably a topic that would be really, really well received if we kind of went and did features and benefits on all of them. And just for, I, I think that'd be a great opportunity to get somebody from like uh, uh, Lead Nav or somebody like that kind of talk about the contrast between their systems versus what we're running. Needless to say, we got a lot to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, navigation is always something that people ask about. You know, who's using what? What do you, What can I put on my iPad? Do I need to buy an iPad yeah. or a dedicated device? What's the differences? Um, you know, what's the mapping? You know, characteristics like like just there's. I really do want to do a full navigation like throwdown, 100%. but it's so detailed and really so complicated is. that it would take forever. And so I think what we'll end up having to do is kind of just do a throwdown on each one individually. And then at the end of the year, maybe do like a comprehensive like overview of each one and w- which one excels at which and, right. and who, who they're all meant for. I think the, inter- you know, uh, our buddy Wes, who went on the Idaho trip with us, said something to me regarding lead nav. He asked me a question. He goes, are you any good at Photoshop? How well do you know Photoshop? And I'm like, I'm functionally adequate at Photoshop. I know how to get what I want. But in terms of the depths of what Photoshop will do, I'm probably at like 20%, maybe 10% of what that software will do. Lead Nav is the same way. You know, they, you know, that was how it was pitched to me is Lead Nav will do things that you would never consider. So having people in there that can competently talk about some of these devices, I think it'd be so cool. If there's one thing that I'm really interested about the tread, the Garmin tread, it's a little smaller unit than I thought. Like it's probably about 25 to 30% bigger than uh, the biggest iPhone or the biggest Samsung droid. And, but the most interesting thing is, is you can track other 
Garmin users. Uh, if anybody other your, Garmin Tread users, correct, right? correct. If if people have the Garmin Tread in your group, you will see where they're at. So I mean, if you could put one at the beginning and one at the end of a large group, that's that's great. And Does have, that require the phone to do that? Do you have to link your phone in to get the, <coughs> the coordinates and the cell service to do that, or is it self-sustained? So the unit itself has an antenna that does all that function. You have to re- like if you were, if I was going to move the uh, the tread from the X3 or from the Pro to the X3, there's a, a, a contraption of, <laughs> of hardware that has to go along with it. You know, I, I think the antenna itself, which it's not a conventional antenna, it's not like a GPS antenna, but it actually has a box that goes with it that's not too terribly big. But I think that function it it functions off that box, off that antenna. So, but I can tell you right now, just based on the little experience I've had on the Garmin platform, I've been really impressed. So I, I'm really excited to run it. I, I, here's the thing. You and I have had conversation about GPS. We've had conversation about technology. This guy sitting over here loves technology and knows a lot about technology. I have no faith whatsoever in technology because technology always fails me. <laughs> Part of it is operator error. I'll be the first one to admit that. But when I go out on a trip, I have a GPS. I have a dedicated GPS. I have a backup GPS, which is usually on the Gaia platform that sits on a like a, a, a RAM mount in my car. And then I have a physical paper map that I go through just in, you know, in case one fails, I've got a backup. If that one fails, I've got a backup. And you, when you're operating in places where cell traffic, cell service is pretty much unavailable, I figure it's a pretty worthy step to take. But, um, I'm kind of geeked on this Garmin setup, man. I know it's expensive and stuff, but it's got some features that look really cool. So which one did you have before? I had the Magellan TRX7 or T TR7 TRX7, I think it. And so it's like the old Triumph car. Kind of give a rundown of what that experience was like versus what you've seen so far on the tread. So it's dated tech, but it did things that I really, really, I, I, I that that to be honest with you, you've got me out of a pickle every now and again. So. You know, I've had that thing for about four years, give or take, and it would it would leave me breadcrumbs where I was coming in and out. It would uh, there's functions that you can do when you interface it in with their website, drop in drop in maps, very similar to what you can do in Gaia. But the thing that I liked about it most was it was just it was just this big dumb head unit that you could read really really well. If it had some limitations, I could tell you, and I'm not you know. We're under no obligation. We can talk about this stuff. <laughs> honestly, you've seen you've seen some of its limitations. Like you and I would approach an opening on a trail system that had five options. Well, you saw the limitations. I watched you. <laughs> right, right. But we would we would pull into an area that had five options, five trail options to divert in five different directions. That system was only giving me one option to leave that area. So essentially, I have a one in five chance of getting the right trail. And I would make a radio call out to you guys and say, okay, I'm going to try this one. Give me like, you know, 30 seconds. <laughs> That'll give me the idea whether or not I'm on the right one. And if and if I wasn't, I had to back out and go pick another one. If That that was one thing that kind of kind of discouraged me. Um, it can be... Was that the limitation of the update speed or was that a limitation of the interface saying, this is the way you, you're going to go. I don't care if you understand which one that is. Yes, <laughs> it was both for sure. And right, uh, there was many times where I'd be watching my maps on the iPad using Gaia and going, "Which one did you take again? Right, the, the, the second one. Right. Oh, you, you're going to want to go back again. <laughs> right, right. And even when you would import the overlay, it still wouldn't show some of those. But it would show you the route. It would show you where you needed to go. Uh, it could be a little buggy every now and then. I'd have it crash every now and then. Mm. Um, but to its credit, when you would fire it back up, it knew exactly where you were and what you were doing. It would reload the <laughs> you route. Mean it did its job. It, it would do its <laughs> job. And I've had some instances where guys would have breakdowns and I had to go recover parts. And it was a very intricate way of getting back to a very specific spot at night. Right. And it, it, it always got me there. So when it did freeze up, did it freeze up like in a way that you noticed and could recognize that it did? Or did it freeze up when you were like 10 minutes down the path and, and didn't realize that your nav wasn't updating? No, it, it, it's bright enough and visible enough and a large enough unit that if it goes off in their peripheral, you'll pick up. You, like you'll see it and notice that something's wrong. <laughs> so on the new one, what if, I mean, you haven't really gotten out with it yet, no, but yet. have you noticed anything just turning it on and looking around with it? Not a thing. I, I literally... Have you even turned it on yet? I took it out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> I the my experience on the Garmin platform is with my inReach and with uh, 
uh, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Our buddy Rich is, uh, he, he runs the Overlander. What, what would be an episode without actually mentioning Rich? So yeah, yeah, Rich is sure. just part of the podcast yeah. from now on. No, but Rich, uh, Rich even commented because, you know, Rich and I are a couple of the biggest uh, gear sluts known to man. And as soon as, you know, as bigger as, than me, I know. As soon as I mentioned getting the tread, Rich had it 24 hours later. <laughs> and so I had to order it and, you know, we'll, we'll find out, you know, he, he did make mention that there are some differences between the Overlander and the tread, but the good news is, is he said the tread is way, way infinitely more catered towards off-roaders. Whereas the, whereas the Overlander has the ability to cater towards off-roaders, but not, you know, it's more centric towards the highway systems, stuff like that. The the search functions, I think, is what he was talking about, that it was a little bit gotcha. better on the Overlander, but the off-road's capability on the tread. I think what we're looking for is we're looking for a, a unit that you could literally pull off your side-by-side and plant it into the head unit or a, a battery port in your Ram pickup or whatever it is that you use to drive to the trailhead. Um, I don't know that the tread's going to be the best feature for that. I don't need to know where people are when I'm driving <laughs> the Ram, but I definitely need to know where they are when we're out on trail. So I'm, I'm stoked. It's interesting with the, uh, we've talked about kind of the niche markification of some of the vehicles coming out and, um, you know, what that looks like in like the desert cars and the, and the rock cars, and the mud cars. Uh, that's happening on the app side too. So like Onyx Off-Road, right? They started off as a kind of like a hunting map system and then they migrated into off-road and now they also have a snowmobile version and they now have a hiking version of Onyx. So it's interesting to see that this is the market of being off-road and doing things is really starting to take off and start becoming more top of mind for companies that want to invest into the community and the ecosystem of options to either navigate or drive or, or do things out on the, on the road. Yeah. Yeah. Onyx and Gaia, I've played around with both of them. I have a subscription to both of them. I, I don't have a preference between the two. I think they're both really, really functional, like the layout and the look of the Onyx system. I really like that. Like it's very, very visible. The, uh, but the Gaia isn't, you know, the Gaia, oddly enough, like, I don't know how you run it. I don't run it on a satellite image. I run it on a, um, I run it on the map on the topographical. I find that that's easier and quicker for me. Yeah. If you're going to run satellite, you are going to take up all the space on your tablet almost instantly. So if you're saving them to the, to the tablet. So, uh, you know, what I found works best, uh, for my style. So there's, there's two different ways of doing navigation, right? There's the top down classic map style where you're looking at a map that you would normally hold, but it's digital. And instead of pointing at a point on the map, you're watching the dot of you on the map. Right. Right. And that's the guy away. That's the way I prefer. Uh, and then there's the, um, the more like car nav system style where it's, uh, got things laid down kind of out of perspective and it's got an arrow and it says, take this left and, and whatever. All about that. And that's kind of what you had before. Um, and I, and I think that it, it removes some of the information that you want, uh, to see, like you want to see the other trail coming ahead and you want to see the four of the five options that you're not on and, and things like that. Um, but, uh, but uh, the way I use it is uh, I'll have the base uh, topo map, you know, to give me my elevations and my and my information there. And then I have the with guy, you can overlay different layers. Mm-hmm. And so I've uh, because I have the subscription, I have access to the forestry updates. So it has the forestry road overlay on top of it. Um, and then there was a third map that I had uh, overlaid on it that was. Uh, somewhat informational, and I can't remember what that was, but basically the forestry map was the most important one, and that would give me 90-some percent of the trails that were not provided by the base Gaia app system. So Gaia would say, you know, you have this one trail to follow where the forestry map would say, here's your trail, but you also have the side shoot, and you have this over here, and you have this other option B and and whatever, and you could take those uh, as options. And, and we did, when we were in the Washington BDR going south, uh, there was a number of the trails that were not on the Gaia yeah. system, but they were on the forestry system. And then we, we took some offshoots that were not on either one of those. So no nav system is currently perfect that I've seen. Yeah. Um, you, you know, for Gaia, though, uh, <laughs> you and I have talked about Gaia a number of times. The one function that I really like is making a route in Gaia is really, really quick and super easy to do. I, I My seven-year-old could do it. That's definitely a plus. You know, I'm 
saying that not having not played with the Garmin, I would assume that the Garmin's probably equally as easy. But the Gaia, the Gaia system for making a route was much easier, in my opinion, than the Magellan. Yeah, and it's it's nice to be able to do other things on the device other than just maps. So I could jump out a Gaia, go into you know maybe some other stuff I had going on just because of the technical stuff that I do, um, and then jump back into maps. Or go and access, you know, uh, PDFs of the forestry map or whatever that I have as resources on the on the device. Uh, so that's a nice benefit of having an iPad integration set up. And the other part of it was the uh, the dual GPS receiver, Bluetooth receiver that I'm using for the actual GPS positioning um, is super fast to to update. So I can be going literally 70 miles an hour down a trail, and it'll put me right on that T. Like uh, you're within about 10, 15 feet, somewhere in there? Like a foot. Oh, like wow. It's, it's that fast. So that's like racer stuff, like Lorentz. Yep. And, and actually, yeah. what what you'll see is, um, you talked about uh, the the uh, trail uh, lead nav. Yeah. Um, a lot of racers use that device with lead nav on iPads. Makes sense. And uh, because it does update that fast. And it's it's rated for aircraft. Yeah. So if, if, an, if it's going to be rated for an aircraft, it's going to do more than fine with your with your. UTV. Right. I think one of the interesting things that, you know, we mentioned, we just mentioned Lawrence, uh, I'll mention Rich again, he has an HD7. And I asked him- And his car is recognized as a boat. Well, I was actually, (laughs) that was literally where I was going with that is he told me at one point when I asked him if he liked it, he goes, well, I finally figured out how it now recognizes my RZR as no longer a fishing (laughs) vessel. But I'm really interested in that setup, man. It's a great looking unit. I, I think it. Uh, Their screens are probably the best screens amazing. you could possibly have on a GPS. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I like big. We'll just go with that. I, I like to just see something out of the peripheral, you know, because I don't, I don't see as well as I used to. In a small GPS, you know, there's, there's trail tech out there that's more suitable to like dual sport riders. I mean, a trail right, tech moto. Is, tra- trail tech's designed to go onto your KTM 500. It'll work great on your car, but. I, I really like to have big visibility so that way my eyes don't have to Work. come out of focus for the road and then l- l- dial into a small looking GPS. I don't think that that's particularly safe, if, especially if you're out front. And, and at, in the daytime, it's not as bad. Right. But when we're riding in the dark, you know, it, it, it's really hard on your eyes. Yeah. And that's one thing I'll give the Magellan a lot of props on because it's as big as an iPad. And you can zoom it out too. What you talked about about having an overlay as opposed to a, a road nav, um, you can pull that. You can pull that Magellan back quite a ways to where it's really, really comfortable, and you can see stuff upcoming. But the over, you know, in terms of the overlays, the Gaia is far superior to the Magellan in that aspect because on the on the Gaia, you see creeks, rivers, bridges, this, that, and the other. You just see a route on the Magellan, right? And that's that's specifically the thing that I hate is not having all that information. Ah. Like if I want if I if there's a bridge around the corner, I want to know that. Yeah. yeah so. You know how I find that stuff out? I find that stuff out by going through uh, just step by step, just with a freaking microscope. Trail prep. Esen- yeah. It's essentially just dissecting a map, and uh, I always know where that stuff is. It'd be a heck of a lot cooler to be able to see it on a one platform. But you're not going to remember, you know. 700 miles into a, a map that there was something around the corner. Like that's, that's okay. why it's important to have it on the screen. I'm that weird dude that will, <laughs> if it raises an alarm with you me, you can't as remember to pro- bring your camera I know. for a podcast, I know, but dude. you can remember a bridge. But if eight people are relying on me that this is only a 50 inch bridge. <laughs> believe me, I know it's there. And I've, and I've talked to eight different people to figure out what, what our, what our options are to get around some of those uh, things. So so speaking of navigation and takeover coming up, something I rem- I was just thinking about remembering was that in in Coos Bay last year, you kept pulling your phone out to figure out which trail to take to get back to the trail that you remembered. Like we would we would be out in the do like going to the beach, right? Like we'd get or yeah. whatever. We'd be in the side shoots or whatever. We were looking for alternative ways to go to the ocean because yeah. there's one main way of doing it, and I didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted to find something else. <laughs> right? Yeah, just for, just to mix it up. Yeah, but it just it's something to think about if you're going to go places that you can potentially get lost in. Have a solution. Yeah, like don't go yeah. blind. Yeah, I mean, out at St. Anthony and 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 Glamis. Those places are so big, people run GPS out of Glamis. I mean, my my step, my brother-in-law goes out there and rides every now and again. He goes, yeah, I've been lost out there. I've had to pull my phone up 
to figure out where the heck I need to go to get back to camp. He goes, the place is huge. They can have 50,000 people at Glamis and you can ride for a half an hour and be away from all of it. Right. Just, yeah. You're the only one out there. But I just, we're, we're talking about prepping for takeover and all that. And I just wanted to, anyone that's listening to think about being prepared. Like yeah. it, even though there's 10,000 people there, even though you have all the sponsors and vendors and stuff, that's, that's not going to help you when you're in the middle of the bush where no one can see yeah. you. So we're, we're about to jump to takeover, but Zach and I can still start talking about overlanding. <laughs> <laughs> if I have the situational preparedness to be ready for it, I would have overlanded at takeover. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, yeah, the car is in the gonna go under the knife, get a new wrap on it, stuff like that. So your cars are gonna look nice and sharp. And there, there's been so much done to the RZR that I forgot. You know, I've, well, I've we haven't even gone over the list. So I, I would talk, earlier I asked would go over the list of changes. So we talked we about just the lights, got, but we, we just got stoked on lights and we got stoked <laughs> on GPS, and we were a half an hour in. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, we did the clutches. So the the pro qualified for the recall you know the the drill points or whatever it was on the clutch was in the wrong spot so instead of taking it in and having it going through the recall process we just yanked the primary and the secondary off rainier yanked the pri- uh, the primary and the secondary off and we put those stm clutches on it i've only ripped it a couple of times around the house they did a power tune on it as well they they i've got a little tuner on it i've probably not even driven the car about a mile it's been so busy since that got done but it picks up. It's very, very fast. Like ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for a big four seater, it's quick, man. So yeah. it woke it up. We did a trio. There's another thing I forgot. We did a trio exhaust. It looks absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the STM clutches though, I don't, I don't want to <laughs> run a clutch cover. They look that good. There's a, they're so uh, bitching. I, I forget the, <clears throat> the company. There's a company that makes a plexiglass cover yeah. for your, for your car that you should probably get. Yeah, I've seen them on the X3s. I haven't seen it on the Pro yet, but I... Oh, I that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm really stoked on on those clutches so far. You know, Rich was talking about some adjustments that we would have to do to it, and he and I took that thing out for just a quick spin, and it comes alive very quick. So, you know, we might play with it down in Coos Bay, but I really don't know how much we'll need to because it's running really well. Yeah, I don't even think you'll have time to <laughs> do Why any not? wrenching while yeah. you're there. We're going to be busy. Yeah. I'll tell you the thing that I'm most pumped about in relation to those two cars, though, is Tuesday, the car goes under the knife with MTS, the X3. MTS, at, at Takeover. M- yep, at Takeover. MTS is going to be on site, and they're tuning. Um, they're going to put limiting straps on it, and they're going to do a full-fledged, holy crap, tune on my 2.5 3.0 combo on my RC. And that's what I'm I, I'm super stoked. Like, I, I'm... I'll be honest with you. I have very, very high expectations for that because that's the first thing you do when you get a motocross bike is you change the suspension. And I've changed uh, springs on my car, made a world of difference on hits. It added a lot of preload into the car. So the car has a tendency in corners to lift. When we were on the vendor ride last year, you felt that real, (laughs) (laughs) despite the fact that Zach was in the car and I was in the car, didn't didn't keep us from pulling up on two wheels on a few times, a few times there. The car's not super planted right now. It's It's it's, springy. It's very springy. And I told them that, and I told them that kind of how I drive. And it was one of those things I I even told them, I'm like, look, dude, I know for a fact that every person that ever talks to you tells you how hard they are on their car. I'm just like, I'm really hard on these cars, man. So just whatever we can do to kind of adapt to those driving styles. I'm getting a lot of lift when I corner and cornering is kind of a big deal to me, but I also want it to take hits. And uh, so the, the X3 is getting done on Tuesday and the pro is getting done on Friday. That's awesome that you even got it in because yeah. their their spots filled up fast. So very fast. Um, super cool to have uh, a shock tuner out on the sand at takeover. So that's going to be awesome. Uh, KWI clutching is going to be out for anyone that oh, wants really? uh, clutching cool. uh, work. They're going to be uh, s- they're going to s- be positioned on the sand drag. So if you're out racing or if you just want to get your car tuned up for the dunes, uh, yeah. visit KWI. Right next to us is Crower. You know, yeah, for, Brian Crower yeah, showing up this year. I mean, they he's been in the hot rod game for years. You know, I mean, Crower cams have been around forever and a day, and you know, they're, now they're starting to do motor work on side by sides. And I, I'm going to pick that guy's ear a little <laughs> bit. I'm really interested. Yeah. So if you are uh, new to Crower, uh, he's a high performance engine builder uh, shop that does really spec, really high end spec work, and uh, they've been getting into UTV game uh, this year. They're actually. I think they're bringing a dyno to take over. 
So it's either them or somebody else next to them. But somebody's bringing a dyno to take over, and you'll be able to take your car, get it tuned, get it. You can go get your shocks tuned. You can go get your clutch tuned. You can go get some performance upgrades put on, and then you can throw it on the dyno and see real world exalt uh, examples of what those things do to your car right. and how they how your investments paying off. So that'll be fun. Uh, yeah. So uh, oh, the- buggy whips coming. Buggy whips is coming. Yeah, you, that, you got a couple friends coming. So my trailer didn't get done in time, and I have X by trailer. Of, you mean your new trailer? My new trailer. Um, I have X amount of footage, and what we do is we look for every vendor wants people to swing into their booth. And when I wound up having some extra space, I threw it out there to the promoters that I can probably bring in a couple extra people, and they were totally cool with it. And I'm really excited to get Buggy Whip out there. Never been to an event like this. And as soon as I pitched it to him, he calls me 48 hours later because he let Jeffrey's performance know that he was going to be out there. And in a week and a half, they've done a full suspension tune, uh, an Evo Dynamite Turbo, a new wrap, just just go down the list. I mean, that car has already been on the cover of UTV Magazine. It's called Project Overkill. The lighting on that car is off the charts. Like, if you can think of it, it's on the Buggy Whip X3. But the thing I'm most stoked about is it's about to hit 400 horsepower. And I was talking to the owner. I'm like, "You're gonna give me those keys, right?" And he's like, "Absolutely." <laughs> so I'm gonna. That's gonna be. That's gonna be bitching. There's gonna be so many cool cars at Takeover that's, this year. It's gonna be crazy. I think it? we're gonna see some more sand cars, don't you? We're gonna see some more unique cars. I don't know about the rails. I mean, there are a handful of rails in the area, and then they're definitely gonna be there. Yeah. Um, and I think last year there was some interesting. I think there was like Hummers and like all sorts of stuff out there. Uh, there was that big uh, Hellbent uh, Jeep out there. Yeah. Oh, that was super cool. Um, I want. I want that. I want. I, I want that, <laughs> and I want to plate it, and I want to take it to work every day. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I, I yeah. want that as my daily. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. But uh, so anyways, yeah, there's going to be a lot of cool cars, a lot of cool companies showing up. Uh, we got a bunch. The athletes are all returning. So we got Al McBeth coming. Uh, he's going to bring his whole crew um, of cars and all that stuff. So he'll be out with his new mach- his new build. He re- rebuilt Medusa. Uh, he's got King Shocks now and, and a whole bunch of other new cool stuff. Uh, we got Blake Wilkie coming. He's bringing Method Wheels with him. Uh, they're going to be doing some sort of special Method Wheel ride um, at the the event where they're giving some stuff away and, and doing some cool stuff there. Um, I don't have all the details yet on that, but I'm assuming that that'll be forthcoming. Yeah. I'm not going to get anything for free, even <laughs> though I run method on everything, but method aren't on my sand tires. So I get to miss out on that unless I want to go follow those guys around on the, uh, the ITP tenacities. <laughs> So, um, and then we got Buggy Whip showing up. We got a whole bunch of different people that um, traditionally haven't been able to make it up to Oregon uh, showing up. And this year, you know, I think there's like an additional several hundred feet of vendor space that really kind of got made out of thin air just to make this happen. So um, it'll be really cool. Side and then by, side by side guys are going to be there too, right? <laughs> side by side guys will be there. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to have a booth to hang out with people, but uh, I don't think you'd have a minute to hang out with them anyway. <laughs> I, I've got a stack schedule for sure. And um, so got uh, my buddy Curtis being my number two and uh, he's Mr. Uh, Hero in the water. So he's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. We had quite a few people show up in, in the fall at, at the event that uh, swung by the booth, said, you know, really appreciated the show, yeah. wa- watched the episodes and stuff. So I'll go ahead and take all that glory. <laughs> You'll be you too busy. You just soak that all You'll up be too and, busy while filming. I'm out working. Exactly, so. exactly. Yeah, it was interesting. We had like, a lot where's of- Zach? I'm just like, just go to the dunes, look for a red beard. <laughs> just <laughs> Look for a just, guy with a camera. Just see that red gleam in the dune distance, exactly. and, and that's where he's at. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, we'll be doing so much filming and, and stuff that it, uh, – I won't be sitting in one spot for very long. And, yeah, uh, for sure. And I know you guys are going to be out filming, doing some stuff too, and, and it should be inter- pretty interesting. I think this will be the most content ever at a takeover ever produced. Be shocked um, if it wasn't. Yeah, and and so it's going to be a good time. It's going to be a lot of work, and uh, I probably am going to die for two weeks when I get back. Um, but uh, content has to do get edited and published, so I can't die for too long. Yeah, I was trying to think about that when the next event stacked up. So you got about <laughs> 20 days before you got to hit the road again, right? Yeah, so Virginia's takeover is like three weeks after takeover, after we get home from takeover. Right. So, uh, yeah, so by the time I get done unpacking and uh, editing content, I'll be flying back out to the East Coast. How much gear do you have to check? <laughs> So to go to Virginia. I've been obsessing for the last four months about my gear and how to minimize and, and 
create cross compatibility between the gear and, and stuff like that. So like, you know, you saw earlier, I have a screen for the, for the camera. It has a battery that goes on it to, to power the screen. Well, that's the same battery that goes on to uh, my slider. And that's the same battery that goes on to some of my lights and, and stuff like that. And then it has USB ports on it. So I can use those for powering my phone or whatever. Um, and then, you know, just, just, making everything cross usable on all the different things that I have to get accomplished so that what I'm actually packing is highly dense and highly, you know, targeted for specific things. Right. Yeah. And you have to take it all the way over to a town. So Grundy, Virginia, just to let you know, is about one tenth the size of <laughs> Cheney, Washington. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so, small. so for Virginia, because we're flying and not not trailering over, um, we're going to put some stuff on a, on a pallet and ship it over there. But for the most part, everything that I'm taking for Virginia is going to fit in my photo bag. Cool. Um, and uh, the that reminds me. Now that I have something else to do today, uh, I need to pack a bag for Virginia and then throw it on the pallet so that it ships to Virginia so I don't have to take it on the airplane. There you go. Uh, because I think what's going to end up happening there is we're going to take, uh, I think I'm flying, I think I'm flying to Seattle and then from Seattle to somewhere and then from there taking a puddle jumper to somewhere and then driving from there to Virginia. <laughs> I, f- I figured you'd probably fly into Knoxville or Nashville. Yeah, it's They're one of about, those. Yeah. There was a lot of complications. Travel those days uh, with everything going on is a lot more expensive, a lot more complicated. So with a, such a huge group of people showing up to put on an event, um, things got mixed around and split up and, and put on different flights and different stuff like that. So um, I'm trying to get there as early as I can to get as much content as I can. Uh, so I think I'm leaving uh, Sunday um, and then flying over Sunday night. I uh, ended up getting there super late and, and whatever, Monday morning. I, I'm... Yeah, in ter- from a media standpoint, I'm super stoked to see what comes out of Coos Bay, just based on the fact that there is, uh, there's probably about five media entities, including yourself, that are collabing. Yeah. So there's not going to be any shortage of of shots, you know, unique shots, ambitious shots. I, I'm really looking forward to see what comes out of there. It could, I, I I'm expecting the best clip that ever happened at that event. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, and I think it's totally reason realistic. And the, the unique thing about this year is we got so many more media people showing up. Like, it's not just the community showing up. It's the community, the bigger community that does more things and does more things on camera. Right. And so uh, I don't want to say YouTube stars and I don't want to say influencers. Like, yeah, some of those people are going to show up, but it's the people that actually, like, go out and film this stuff. Like, they're showing up. and The real heroes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the, 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 what happens when that ha- when those people show up, and then you have the community that's behind them and, and excited. And then you have the vendors and the sponsors that are excited. Uh, ultimately, what happens is everybody wants to get out and have fun. And when everybody's out having fun and everybody has cameras, you know it's going to have some <laughs> some staying power for online. Sure. For sure. So it'll be a good time for sure. Uh, activities. What are some of your... I know you don't participate in all the activities per se, but what are your, what are your favorite activities to watch? Um, my favorite activities, I, I'm a, personally, I'm a fan of every activity at takeover because then I can go ride the dunes with less traffic. So (laughs) I'm kidding. I, I, I go to, uh, I, I, I'll check in on the drag races. Those are always cool. Huckfest, Huckfest. I missed Huckfest in Utah and I heard there was something cool that happened. Something happened there. I checked out Huckfest in Coos Bay in the fall and Wheelie Fest. I'm not going to miss Wheelie Fest. Wheelie Fest is awesome. Yeah, so, so, so those assen- are the ones that I'm into. Essentially, you missed out on Al McBeth last year. <laughs> right, right. So uh, you definitely don't want to miss it in Oregon. Um, he missed out last year because of the border clo- closing and all that stuff. And this year, not only do we have Al McBeth doing an exhibition jump, and, and just to clarify, I think people, um, some, of the, some of the jumpers in past years have gotten frustrated with these big guys coming out like Al McBeth and whatever, jumping their just cars and just yeah. shutting down the competition, yeah. right? Like there was just was no opportunity for you to compete. Yeah. And... Um, the awesome thing about the last year and that going into this year is that we've changed, you know, what he does into an ex- exhibition where he's allowed to do his world record attempts and, and, and make what it is put happen show. and put the show on. Yeah. Um, whereas everybody else can then partake in the competition and actually have an equal and fair chance at, at actually winning. Right. So that's really cool. And so um, 
you know, Ruslan's will be back out, but he's bringing his new car. Uh, Which one, the Turbo S or the RS1? So his uh, RS1's turned into a jump car, and they've got rebuilt it. the entire chassis from the ground up. Uh, they got a new, uh, I think it's a Turbo S motor or a Pro, a Pro motor. One of those motors are in it, uh, and it's super hopped up. Like, it's, it's probably twice the horsepower. So is he competing or demoing? Uh, I believe he's competing, yeah. Yeah, so he's got an equal fair chance as everybody else. Um, he doesn't have any special corporate sponsorship to put out a fancy car or anything like that. So um, he's uh, he's riding, uh, you know, going for the glory. Cool. And uh, we got a lot of other people that are going to show up. I, I know um, something that you might be interested in, um, uh, Whiskey Throttle Off-Road, which is just kind of like an off-road group. I'm familiar. Um, they had a, a YXZ jumping in Utah last year. And um, he had probably the longest jump besides Ruslan and, and, and Al and all that. Um, but uh, that car was pretty hot and it went pretty far. Uh, but he took out the front end on it uh, on one of his jumps. So he rebuilt the entire front end suspension and all that with new shocks. And uh, they now stick way out of the front end of the car and, and have bump stops on them and, and all that stuff. It looks like Dracula sitting there with big fangs. So that'll be a cool car to watch in Utah for sure. Yeah, I, I haven't uh, organized anything specific for takeover, which I usually do. We'll do a ride out to so there's this memorial tree. It's way in the you know it's very far north of. Well, I need you to show me where that's at. Sure. We never made it out yeah, last no year, problem. so no problem. It's it, it, so the memorial tree. I don't have the exact history on it, so if I butcher it, I absolutely apologize. But if you go out to the memorial tree, it's like this swing, and you'll see things people have hand engraved. Um, woodwork and then pinned it to this tree for people that they, you know, obviously it's like wheeling buddies and riding buddies that they've lost over the years. It's a really kind of a humbling thing. It's really a unique thing. And um, we will probably, I'll probably try and get a ride together to take a few people back to that and then wind up at the beach because if there's one thing I'm, tr I'm trying to capitalize in 2021 that has been kind of a tough undertaking because the trailer isn't done or anything, but uh, full throttle battery actually turns five five years old at that event literally the days were there so it would be kind of cool to hand out a few t-shirts hand out some stickers and stuff and maybe take about 30 to 50 people back there i've done that in the past it's definitely hurting cats but it's uh <laughs> I, I i would like to do something like that it'd be a lot of fun yeah that's uh you you're getting a shout out for your dixon uh shreddy flannel there on on youtube so shout out to to dixon yeah um and shreddy life um so I think that it'll be a lot of fun to to do something like that. I think it'd be cool to do maybe um, a quick edit on on your guys' history in the five years that you've been in it sure. and all that. That'd be fun to do. Sure. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, Wheelie Fest, Huck Fest, those are the obvious choices for things to go see. Nobody's going to have a bad time at Wheelie yeah. Fest, man. <laughs> no one's, no one's going to leave that place yeah, grumpy, so unless sure. you wreck your car. But yeah. um, but I think some of the other ones are, are, are super important to recognize, too, like just getting your family out and going to the tire toss or uh, dizzy days where you spin around a bat and race back to the car. And, and, you know, some of those other little things that are, they're not these big showmanship type activities, but they're definitely memories that you and your family can have at an event that you don't get anywhere else. Right. And I think that's really important to recognize that you can go out and every single day of the event, have fun with your family and make memories and, and keep, get your phone out, take pictures, take video. Um, I highly recommend doing slow-mo on your phone quite for often. Sure. For sure. <laughs> if there's something I think we should probably put out there too is the way that the industry is growing. We're going to have a lot of new folks that are coming. Yep. And if, if, if you have a tendency to be a little bit introverted, I would, I would recommend not. Um, this is going to be an event. Let's just say that you're new to UTV. You're definitely new to UTV Takeover and you come out to an event like this. Come find us. Come say hi. Come shake hands. If you want to meet people, come see us. Go see the event promoters. They're everywhere. You know, Don, Don's going to wander around with a microphone in his hand, tap him on the shoulder, something like yep. that. Introduce yourself to, to the, if, if somebody's wearing a UTV takeover hat, there's a very good chance that they're pretty connected. If you see a Northwest UTV shirt or hat, I guarantee you those guys know a lot of the Northwest UTV community. So if you want to meet people, if you want to go out on the, on rides, if you're new to those dunes, and you're just showing up for the first time to take in, take over, mingle with some people that can take you and show you, uh, show you around. And if you're brand new to UTV, maybe they might have something to offer to you that's going to keep you and your family safe. Because right. you know, when you put 15, 20,000 people on those dunes, you kind of got to get a little bit tight quarters pretty quickly. Yes. You want people to have a great time. And, uh, you know, I'll be the first one to hop behind the wheel of a car. 
if somebody is new to this and, and kind of just give them a bearing on where you can go and have some, have a good time safely. So just real quick, just to provide some value, like what are your top three uh, things that you would recommend to a new dinner? Like my first thing is to not go fast the first time down the dunes, like go explore, go do your thing, realize how your car handles in the sand. Like, uh, let me refrain, rephrase. First, get paddles on your car. Coos Bays is not going to be a very fun experience if you're sitting at the bottom of the dunes, peeling your tires out, not going anywhere. So come prepared. But go slow. Don't try to to mash the throttle the entire time. Take in the scenery. Start learning lands, landmarks, things like that. You know, start using hand signals. Understand what those are. What are some of your uh, takeaways for for new people out in the dunes that take over this year? Uh, most of it is like feel related. You know, there's so many instances when you're climbing dunes or when you're turning down where uh, throttle is your friend, and then there's situations where it's not. Right. And and just trying to find that balance. Especially like when you're cro- when you're climbing dunes, you can wind up in a world of hurt if you don't treat that situation respectfully. You're to go up some of those dunes, you know, 45, 50, 60 degree pitch. If you crest them too high, you're gonna go send it. You're gonna go sendy boy. I was gonna say very, no, very hurt. Yeah, try to try to yeah. come at an angle. Don't go over the top straight on. Yeah, I mean, even if you do go over the top straight on, you gotta you know you gotta know what you're doing with the gas pedal and stuff. I mean, you want to attack it with some momentum. I mean, momentum is your friend. It's mostly it's very similar to a dirt bike. Everybody tells you that the faster you go on a dirt bike, the easier it is, and it's the same in UTV within reason. Like Coos Bay has a lot of trails and they're only single lane trails. If you're going Mach 9 through trails into a blind hit or into a, uh, a treed area where you can't see, um, very, very likely that you are going to run into somebody, especially this time of year with so many people out there. But the other thing is too, is trail etiquette. You know, when you're going out to the ocean, there's one, two, three, somewhere in there, uh, trails that'll take you out to the ocean and then you um what you want to do is you want to you you want to raise your hand if if you're riding with a group trail etiquette uh, trail signals essentially if you're leading a group of three machines and there's three machines behind you when you come across somebody flash a three at them show i mean that how that is interpreted is that there's three machines following me so be careful yeah and uh on those trails that go out to the ocean stay as far to the right as possible because yeah. people scream through there and i'm guilty of it too yeah there's there's no shortage of guys that are mashing the the throttle on these trails and uh guys that have been there you know a hundred times and know every single turn uh, better than you will ever do. And, and they feel like they are invincible and, you know, in, in certain circumstances, they're going to know that, you know, around this corner, I have plenty of room. I'm not going to worry about it. But at the same time, you know, you never know who's there and you never know who's broke down. You never know who avoided somebody else. You know, it, it, a trail gets real narrow real quick when you're avoiding somebody else. And now you're two wide or three wide or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into the saying that says, you know, I would rather, take those trails at night because i know it's safer yeah which is totally backwards from your your logic thing you can see that lights you, coming though you can but you can see the car coming at yeah. you and when you're not afraid of the terrain you're more afraid of the people coming at you you know those situations happen but um you know and i've been to take i've been to coos bay and i've been to winchester bay on down weekends where we go so we won't run into a lot of traffic and i've run into the i've run into people that they're not paying attention when they're going down the trail they got their head turned around because they're yelling at kids in the back of the forest right, this right. is this is not the place for that right not the place for that whatsoever you need to have your head on a swivel when you're out there on those trails and what you just said about nighttime i mean it, it, nighttime gives you a massive advantage out at Coos Bay. Like you're, you're not, you're not going to get surprised by anything because the light, once the sun goes down, it gets very, very dark out there. <laughs> so if there's light to be seen, you're going to spot it. No question about and it. And the interesting thing about Coos Bay is when you get over to that, to the side where the brush is and the, and the little mole hills and stuff like that, uh, there's a lot of fun to dart in and out of and stuff, but you have zero light. That's why and, people love Coos Bay is for what you just <laughs> yeah, said. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but one thing that caught some people off guard last year was the fact that just because you're darting between these things doesn't mean they're all going to be the same. Like last year we were on some trails and, and we, we went around a molehill and all of a sudden there was like a huge drop off yep. or there was a huge hill or a, a kicker or, you know, 45 degrees or something just because you're going through 10, 20, 30, 40 of these darts and they're all the same flat carves doesn't mean the next one's going to be that way. Yeah. And, and the way the wind blows out there too, typically if you're headed south, that's where you're going to see the witch eyes that drop. But if the wind's been weird out there, you're going to see it on both sides. And I've seen cars, uh, I've seen cars have very, very bad accidents and that's, 
even going north. You know, going north where theoretically the drops aren't going to be as harsh and you're going to be able to see them better. I've still seen our, uh, side-by-sides just yarded at the bottom of a dune because a guy lost just, uh, he made a mistake. And right. uh, I mean, you make a mistake on some of those dunes out there and you're able to walk away from it, honestly, consider yourself lucky because some right. of those things are very, very tall. Yeah, that's something to take into consideration, you know. All these new people coming to the to the market um, and going to the dunes to enjoy these big activities for the first time. Uh, a lot of them, like we said, are first time on dunes, first time in these dunes or or whatever. Um, have those safety meetings with your family before you go out. Like have that discussion. If we were to get into a situation where we are tipping over, rolling, lawn darting, something, what do you do? Yeah. Don't put your hands out the window. Grab your seatbelt. Grab your harness. Like keep your hands planted somewhere. Do not let them move. Yeah. And wear your helmets, wear your goggles, all those things. How many people every year forget to wear goggles on the dunes and just hate life because sand's in their eye or the rain's hitting them or, or whatever? I mean, we've all done it. Like, that's another big thing. Just always take goggles. Even if you don't feel like wearing them now, just put them in the glove box. You're going to you're gonna wish you had them later. Um, and, uh, and, and even though, you know, a lot of the times we, we're not required by law to wear helmets, I always recommend wearing a helmet. It's always better safe than sorry. Um, it can help cut down on noise, like <laughs> like your car, with the freaking monstrous intake. Um, you know, it can help in a lot of situ- situations and then also comms, you know, things like that. So uh, speaking of comms, there's, you know, we got some title sponsors coming this uh, this tour. We got Rugged uh, coming up with the comms. We have um, uh, Super ATV with all their suspension upgrades. We have... Um, uh, why am I forgetting? Uh, we have uh, CST tires coming out, so you can check out their booth and, and get some paddles. Yeah, um, I, sh- I should know this, but is Evo coming? I don't think they're on the official <laughs> vendor list. Um, DW is coming, aren't they? Um, not in. Okay, they were in Utah last year. That's why. Yeah, I, I don't think in Oregon. Gotcha. Um, and then uh, lastly, Mid America. So if you're not familiar with Mid America, they're an off road park in um, Oklahoma. And uh, they're right on the Disney Trail and, and all that stuff. And uh, they just had some big events. They got a big event coming right before Virginia, Visions Off-Road. Um, check that out if you're in the area. Uh, so anyways, some some awesome sponsors this year. And then we got some officials in Oregon. We got Monster Energy Drink as the official energy drink again. We got um, Sector 7, which you know, you're familiar with on your cars as the official light. We've got... Uh, 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 a Luma trailer, which sponsored the the uh, uh, the takeover trailer, which has been amazing. Um, Addi- I, addiction superior. Uh, yeah, so they're Both elite those. sponsors yeah. um, of the event, putting on uh, some of the, like Hillfest. I think it's superior um, and addiction. Um, the is, steps those two those two stores go to to help oh, for people sure. is just off the charts. Like nine o'clock, ten o'clock at night, they'll still be wrenching. Yeah. Well, and their whole out. crew will be yeah. too. Bo- both of them, superior uh, and addiction. They're just, I mean, we're really lucky to have them up here. Yeah. I mean, you, uh, there's pretty much nobody that's that's even been a part of either of those two shops that ha- doesn't have just high praise of everything they've sure. done. So uh, shout out to BJ. He's hooking us up this year with some stuff and, and more to come on that when we're there. Shout um, out to Will for keeping my X3 alive. <laughs> <laughs> for, t- for rebuilding the X3. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so those guys are all awesome and their shops are awesome. And, and I know like they got some new websites coming. They've got new products. Uh, Superior just started uh, Superior RC, which is really yep. cool. Check them out. Uh, I know they've been looking, like trying to figure out their shop situation for that and all that, but uh, I can't wait to, to go throw down on some carpet with them. Yeah, I won't let the cat out of the bag, but, but they are, uh, both of those, uh, Superior and Addiction, are starting to get a little bit more serious about part development, in-house stuff. Yeah. That's killer. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, they're both producing products, not just reselling them, right? Yeah. Like they got cages, they've got exhausts, they've got uh, turbo kits, they've got pretty much the whole gambit. Absolutely. Shock tower braces, the whole ball of wax. And I, it's going to keep coming, man. So I, I'm really, it, it's great to have a source for stuff like that up here because we break things. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, a lot of people talk about Utah. Last year at UTV Takeover, there was a lot of talk about local business and local companies and how rich they are down there with, with uh, fab houses and, and things like that. And HCR is down there and, and all that stuff. And, and, you know, it's so cool to start seeing people investing in that in the Northwest, you know, building that community, um, the options for the community to invest locally uh, in their areas and support their local business. And, and they're doing this stuff because they're enthusiasts. They see a need for this stuff. I mean, BJ, BJ, Will, all those guys, they all yeah. ride. So. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't watched the episode with uh, BJ and, and crew, 
uh, you know, they're out racing the the courses. They're out pushing their cars to the limits and doing as much as possible yeah. to figure out what works best. Yeah, you'll see Will out at the sand dunes, out at Florence, from Winch Florence to Winchester to Coos Bay. BJ, you'll see BJ on sand. You'll see Trevor from uh, Addiction. Uh, you know, he, he he'll he'll take a Turbo S out there and go compete in some of the rock crawl challenges and yep. stuff. And I think they I think they actually did King of Hammers once or they twice. Did, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, check that episode out. We talk about King of Hammers, and we talk about uh, the rock crawl they did and, and a bunch of other stuff, and, and they pretty much got buried in mud that <laughs> on that race. So, <laughs> And he raced it with uh, with his wife, which was really cool. Did so. you go down to that? I didn't go down to it. Uh, I was busy, but, uh, I mean, that's a pretty long drive just to jump over and, and take some photo. But, yeah. um, uh, but we had them on the way back through when they were traveling back home um, to stop by for a podcast. So it was oh, pretty, that's right. That's yeah, right. it was yeah. pretty cool. That's cool. Um, so, yeah, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, take over everybody should go and experience it at least once in their life. Um, it's a Especially great time. if you live in the Pacific Northwest, if you're, if you're an enthusiast, it's a great time. Yeah. If you live in the Northwest and you haven't been to Oregon takeover, then I don't know if we can be friends, but <laughs> just, just unfollow me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you see us out at takeover, we're going to be super busy, but, uh, if we're, we're not moving around, uh, feel free to come shake our hands and, and meet us. And I know that uh, all year long, I've been getting stories of people, you know, talking about, "Hey, we talked to you at Takeover. It was super cool, and, that's and all that." And uh, my wife uh, works with somebody that was just like, "Oh my gosh, that's your husband!" You know, like it's, it's starting to happen where people are are um, getting out of their comfort zone, saying hi, shaking hands, and all that, and that's totally cool. Like, I'm not opposed to it. So feel free to come say hi, um, and uh, we'll be doing some podcasts from the event uh, on the syndicate off-road trailer again uh sponsored by those guys to do that and um yeah we got a lot of stuff going on throughout the days uh hopefully we can get a lot of cool content ripping with some of these uh awesome people that are going to be there in, in their cars yeah as far as takeover goes i've never been to a rock concert which is as good i've never been to a football game which is as good you know takeover just crushes i mean if takeover is a 10 the best rock concert i've ever been to in my life was a two you know, the best football <laughs> game I've ever been to is a two. It's a totally different experience. It's, it's a blast. And, you know, I'm, the event, the proof's in the pudding because the event sold out in like two minutes, which is yeah. the same time it takes Zach's favorite band, Pearl Jam, to sell out a concert. <laughs> so, For the record, I hate Pearl Jam. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, it'll be a good time. Um, and looking forward to... <laughs> Honestly, I'm looking forward totally to having just this. Threw, just threw a wrench <laughs> just in threw the whole out. process. Uh, looking forward to getting this uh, wrapped up and in the books and and uh, be able to talk about the after effect of all of it and, and all that. So, um, Dude, I think we're going live forever now. I mean, we're just we're just killing this. <laughs> <laughs> we we still got like three hours to keep, keep up with George. So yeah, <laughs> he, uh, he's normally like two and a half, three and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, look forward to seeing everybody there and. Uh, We'll, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm what, pretty, what else? We, my brain cells are all expired yeah, from prepping. So we, we, we got to get back to work. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I mean, you saw me when you showed up today. Like, I'm just kind of just like, I want to sit down for a minute and talk. Well, I've been, uh, I've been up working since about 4 a.m. from, you know, I, I just got the trailer back, had to get the trailer rebuilt, picked it up before I came here. I have to take the trailer back home, get it cleaned up, ready for the event, wash two side by sides. It's going to be a busy night, man. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. And, yeah. and I got, you know, truck prep to do. I got to go get new tires. I got to get, uh, I got to fix some car parts. I got a whole bunch of stuff to do just there, let alone all the videos I want to put out before we leave and more filming before we leave and f equipment, figuring out how to work live stream switcher boards and yeah. all sorts of stuff. Oh, you so. nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I nailed I, it with I, my monster. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I, I was looking at that. I, there, there's no way I could, I, I would give up after 10 minutes. I'm like, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot more buttons than one. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, anyways, uh, yeah, this has been kind of a crazy podcast, just trying to get it to put together and then, you know, whatever and, and, uh, trying new things. And, and we tried our first live stream today and it wasn't like we were trying to get everybody on the live stream today. I was just trying to see if it works. Yeah. We and, started out a little slow too, while we were kind of playing around, well, yeah. trying to figure out. I think we hit the record button maybe about <laughs> 20 it's probably, times. It's probably about two minutes of dead air. They were like, oh, I, I see myself. Yeah, I'm pretty, su 
pretty sure somebody saw my belly button at one point. And, uh, <laughs> I, I did, buddy. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, I uh, just wanted to wrap up the episode. Say thank you to everybody that's been supporting what we're doing. Uh, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, all the places. Uh, go subscribe. If there's a like button or a rating, please give us a thumbs up or a five star if you're so inclined. And uh, can, can you can you upgrade this pitch here? Like, uh, come on, be be the YouTube <laughs> smash that like button. <laughs> I can't do... Smash that subscribe button. <laughs> I can't do it. It's not in me. I I believe in you. <laughs> yeah, are, are you saying I can do shit up with the best of them? 100%. <laughs> All right, just, everybody. Just, just flatten that bill out. I just need to flip it up. I need to do the, I need to do the little curl up on the, on the brim. Anyways, go. let's end this episode. Everybody else out there, peace. Peace.